Hello everyone, and this is Klaus Aranha from Scuba University. Uh, this is Experiments Design, uh, Lecture 3, Part 2, um, <clears throat> Statistical Inference. So, we're, go uh, we're going to talk today first about what is statistical inference. So, the idea of statistical inference is to use data analysis so that we can deduce properties of a statistical distribution. So the idea, like we said last, last uh, week, uh, you have an experiment, you want to, you have some scientific question, and the scientific question is in the form of trying to learn some properties or parameters from some system in the world. For example, we were talking in the last video about the chocolate factory, and you want to know if the production of the chocolate factory is really the same number that it was supposed to be. There's no errors or no differences or no imprecisions in the model. And to do that, you do an experiment, which means taking a sample, a series of observations from the, from the process you are observing, and estimating the population parameter from the sample parameter. <clears throat> now, one thing that is important to remember is that the sample from the distribution is a random variable. Every time you take a sample, so we can see here in this figure, every sample that you take will be different. All the samples, they come from the same population, so they are similar. Uh, but each sample may be slightly different from each other. It's like when you roll a dice, right? The dice has six, uh, this dice has six faces, unless you play Dungeons and Dragons. And Every time you roll, you get a different number, but you know that this number comes from the same system, from the same dice, okay? Now, this system is called the sampling distribution. So when I say sampling distribution, I say the same characteristics that are common to all of the samples. The sample distribution is characterized by the parameters, by some parameters. So when we deduce properties of the sample distribution, we can use these properties to characterize the population. Okay, so the idea is that the experiment gives us data. This data, the sample data comes from a sample distribution. And by understanding the sample distribution, we can estimate, we can infer population parameters. So the idea is that we're going to, to do statistical inference. Today we're going to learn of a tool that you probably have heard about, which is called statistical hypothesis. So hypothesis is a word that has different meanings in different contexts. Contexts. In general, we can say that a hypothesis is an explanation for something that we observe. So for instance, uh, you're going out to a party, but the house is dark and the door is locked. So you, you make a hypothesis that maybe your friend did not arrive yet, or maybe you are early. This is like a everyday use of the word hypothesis. When we're talking about a scientific hypothesis, this is a hypothesis that must be testable and falsifiable. And we talked about this uh, last week. We're going to talk a little bit later. And when we're talking of more specifically a statistical hypothesis, it's a scientific hypothesis that focus on statistical elements, on properties, on parameters of the population that we are studying. So going back to the cocoa factory example, we can say that our cocoa fa we have a hypothesis that the cocoa factory is working normally. So the mean of the production is no less than 300 grams. So that's how hypothesis, the cocoa factory is working without a problem and the mean of every time I take a sample is 300 grams. Now, is this hypothesis testable? Yes, it's testable. I can take a sample of a number of cocoa packages and I can measure that. Is it falsifiable? Yes, uh, if I take a sample and I estimate the mean and the mean is much below 300 grams, then my hypothesis will turn out to become false. Now here's the question. How do we decide from the data if the hypothesis is false or true? Okay, so in general, uh, the idea is that when we are analyzing a system using statistical inference, we propose many different hypotheses 
and we gather the data from the experiment and we compare this hypothesis against the data. So the idea is that we're going to decide which of the hypotheses that were proposed is most likely to be true. For example, let's say that we took 10 cans of cocoa from our factory and we measure. And we have the first one has 293 grams, the second one is 325, the third one is 271, then 313, 309, 298, 284, 304, 248, 296. Also, we take the mean of the sample, which as we said last week, is a good estimator of the mean of the population. And the mean of the sample is 294. Now, this mean of the sample 294 is less than the parameter that the, the parameter that we are assuming that we are hypothesizing to be the mean of the, popula the population. We hypothesized that the mean of the population was 300 grams. We took an experiment and we found that the mean of this sample is 294. Does this mean that our fact or our hypothesis is false? Well, this is a question that is not so easy to answer. First, let's think about several hypotheses that we could make from this data, okay? The first hypothesis is very simple. The factory mean is correct, it's 300 grams. We were just unlucky in this sample. So as we can see here in the sample, we have some numbers that are much higher than 300, than 300, like this one and this one and this one, they are all higher than 300. And then we have some that are lower than 300. But on average, if we take the sample again, again, and again, sometimes the hypothesis, the, the mean will be a little bit higher than 300. Sometimes the mean will be a little bit lower than 300. That's the nature of random samples. So the first hypothesis is that this particular sample was just bad luck. Okay. However, our second hypothesis is that the factory mean is in fact lower than 300. The factory has a problem, okay? So this mean of 229, 200, uh, 294 indicates that our, the mean of our factory is not 300. So that's our second hypothesis. Now we can make more, for instance, we can make a third hypothesis that says that there is a saboteur in our factory. There is one employee that replaced two of the samples with very low value. We've seen these values that are very, very low. So our third hypothesis is that these values are not common and this sample was actually sabotaged. That's a hypothesis, okay? Anyway, the fourth hypothesis is that the balance that we use, the, 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 the measure that we use to calculate the weight is broken. So all of these weights they might be wrong because our balance is wrong, is broken. That's a hypothesis, okay? Can we test it? Can, does this hypothesis reflect this data? That's the question that we need to answer. Also, we can make a hypothesis that the factory production depends on the hour of the day. So maybe in the morning, for some reason, like because the machines are still like not very heat, not very warm, not very warm, in the morning, the production is low, but in the afternoon, the production is high. Can we support this last hypothesis from the data? Well, one thing about this data is that we have no information about the time. So it's absolutely possible to talk about the last time hypothesis. The fourth and the, the third and the fourth hypothesis, they also need some data that is kind of external, some information that is external to this sample data that we have right now. So it will be kind of difficult to evaluate those hypotheses. So, when we compare hypotheses, we want to keep several criteria in mind. The first high criteria of the hypothesis is predictive power. Predictive power means that the hypothesis allows you to predict the future behavior of the system. So if we look at the hypothesis number three, the AVO employee saboteur, the problem with hypothesis number three is that even if it's true, it doesn't say anything. It, it doesn't say anything about future packages. We don't know if future packages will be sabotaged or not. So we cannot use the third 
hypothesis to predict anything about the future. So it's not very useful. The, the, third, the, the, second hypo, the second principle is principle of parsimony, also known as Ockham Hazers, Ockham Razor. This means that when two hypotheses are equal, the simplest one is usually better. So this means uh, hypothesis number five. The hypothesis number five depends on the hour of the day. This is including extra information. If we can get the same predictive power with a simpler hypothesis, in general, we want to favor the simpler hypothesis that does not include extra information. Now, the third is what we're going to study in this, in this, co in this course, is that fitting the data. The data support the hypothesis and has a high probability of being produced under it. So the idea is that we're gonna have between, so we have, look at the first two hypotheses. The first one is the sample mean is under 300 is bad luck. And the second hypothesis is the factory mean is under 300. So which of these two hypotheses is more likely to fit this data? Well, there's a calculation for that and that's what we're gonna see in this lecture. Okay, finally, external consistency. This hypothesis fit with existing well accepted knowledge about the system. This usually means that you want to know what the system, like you don't want to make a hypothesis that does not match at all with reality. So maybe you can say that in your production, you can raise a, a hypothesis that your production of chocolate follow prime numbers, but there's no reason at all to believe why would a system produce uh, packages that follow prime numbers? What kind of system is that? So that's kind of like external consistent. You, you want your hypothesis to be kind of uh, fit what you, are, what you believe about the world in general, okay? okay so, so let's think of, let's talk about how comparing, we can compare how well the hypothesis fit the data. Okay, so one way, the third way that we can compare multiple hypotheses is to calculate the probability of the sample that we observed under each hypothesis. So this is the conditional probability that we studied in high school. Okay, so we think what is the probability of seeing this sample when we have hypothesis one? What is the probability of seeing this sample when we have hypothesis two? What is the probability of seeing this sample when we have hypothesis three? we get the, pro the highest probability of all these probabilities de depending on hypothesis indicates that that hypothesis is more likely than the others, okay? So let's think about two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, the mean of the production is equal or more than 300. So this implies on the following question. What is the probability that we see this sample, x293, 325, 271, 313, when the mean production of the factory is at least 300 grams. Now think about hypothesis two. The mean of the population is less than 300, and let's add this minus delta. We said before in a few slides ago that we are interested in, uh, in probabilities that in hypotheses that are in samples that are much less than 300. Uh, I'm gonna explain more about this uh, in the following slide, but just imagine that detecting the, differ the difference between 299.99 and 300 is almost impossible. So we're gonna use this sort of interval. We're gonna talk about this in the next slide. So what is the probability that we see the sample, the same sample when the mean production of the factory is much lower than 300 grams? So this is usually called the new hypothesis significance testing, okay? So the idea is that the, the new hypothesis testing involves the contrast between two hypotheses. One, we're gonna call the new hypothesis or H0, and the other, we're gonna call the alternate hypothesis or H1. So the idea is that the new hypothesis is the hypothesis that nothing strange is going on. Everything is fine. Everything is as expected. The factory is producing as much as we expected it to produce. The two algorithms are equal. The new algorithm is not better than the existing ones. The new medicine has no special effects. Nothing is going on. Everything is as we already knew. 
okay? So that's the new hypothesis, the absence of effect, the conservative model. So in this case, the new hypothesis is the mean production of the chocolate factory is at least 300 grams. Now, the alternate hypothesis is that there is something different going on, something new is happening. So for some reason, and notice that because this is a statistical hypothesis, we do not say what reason it is. We first, we just want to say if statistically, this parameter, this hypothesis is only about the parameter mean of the population. The, the, new, hypo, the new hypothesis testing does not say anything about the reason. So for some reason, the mean production is below 300 grams. So the alternate hypothesis is that mean is under 300. So how do we choose the new hypothesis? Well, the idea is that to choose the new hypothesis, we use existing knowledge about the process that we are being investigated. Investigating. For example, uh, the manual said that the factory should produce 300 grams, so that's our new hypothesis. Things are as expected. Or for example, if you are doing an experiment to validate a model, you can use values from the model that you are trying to validate as your new value. Or if you're doing an experiment to investigate a system, the system compliance, then you use the compliance values as your new hypothesis. Okay? So in going back to the chocolate, we suspect that may be a problem in your chocolate production. So we propose sampling 20 packages and we estimate the mean of the population from the sample. Our new hypothesis is the estimated mean is over 300, sorry, the population mean is over 300, and the alternate hypothesis is the, S, the population mean is under 300. Note that when we're doing the new hypothesis testing, we make several assumptions about the system. Some of these assumptions are technical and some are statistical. So the first assumption that we do is that the mean is a good measure for the question of interest. When we say that the mean is a good measure, it says that individual variations of packages are not so important. What is important as is that we establish the mean of the system. Also, another thing that we estimate, we are assuming is that the packages that we took from the sample are representative for no population of interest. For example, if we only have one factory, then it's okay to sample only from this factory. But let's say that you are the king of the chocolate empire. You have 30 factories all over Japan. In that case, if you only sample from one factory, then that sample is not representative of your entire empire anymore. Maybe that, that factory is not very good, but your entire empire in general is performing okay. So you need to know if your sample is representative of the question that you are asking. Are you interested in the performance of your entire chocolate empire? Or are you interested in the performance of this one factory? Okay. Also, uh, there are other hypotheses. We are assuming that in the package there is actually chocolate. This means that when I'm measuring 300 grams, it's all chocolate. It's not like the package measure 200 grams and the chocolate measure only 100. Because if the package me measures 200, maybe the package is always the same weight. It's a more, more, much more stable uh, process. Or maybe the opposite is true. So we, if, if two different processes work together to do that 300 gram, then that will affect your calculations. So you need to think about all the hypotheses, all the assumptions that you are making when you construct your hypothesis testing. So after you define your hypothesis and after you thought about your assumptions you, and you collected the data, we are going to do the data analysis. So the testing procedure is one, you obtain a sample, you run the experiment. Two, you calculate the test statistics. Remember that the word statistics here means a function based on the sample data. So the test statistics is the data that you process from the sample that will tell you what's the result of the test. So we calculate the test statistics from the sample data. Three, we make a decision based on the computed value. So the sample mean is a good estimator for the population mean. So we can decide if the new hypothesis is true or if the alternate hypothesis is true based on the value of the sample mean, okay? Now the question is, 
what is the value that should be done? Remember that, as I said, because this is a random sample, sometimes by pure luck, the value might be a little bit below 300. So we want to have some sort of safety. We don't have this delta that if the estimated, if the estimated mean is a little below 300, then we still say that no, we, we, mu we must consider that this is bad luck. But if the estimated mean is much lower than 300, then we will say, no, this is not luck. This is not a coincidence. Uh, the mean of the population is not 300. Even if we had the worst possible luck, we could never have this value. So this defines two regions. The rejection region is when we reject the null hypothesis and we say that the alternate hypothesis must be true. And the expected region is when we do not reject the new hypothesis and we say that the alternate hypothesis must not be true. And how do we choose this delta? How do we choose this difference? Remember that when we est the parameter estimator is a random variable and there is an estimator error. Because of this, there is the chance that the hypothesis test reaches a wrong conclusion. If the estimator error is too large, so if we choose, sorry, if the estimator is too large, the sample mean could be the rejected region, if rejection region, even if the new hypothesis is true. So if, if this delta is too big, then for instance, we, it could be that the true, if let's say that we choose the delta to be 50 grams, it could be that the true population mean is 270 grams, which is below the number that we are interested, but it's above the threshold. So we would lose that. On the other hand, if delta is too big, okay, the sample mean could be in the expected region, even the hypothesis is not true. Okay, so we want to estimate and control the probability of these errors. So there are two types of errors that we want to control. We want to control the type one error and the type two error. The type one error is the false positive. The type one error happens when we reject the new hypothesis when the new hypothesis is true. So the probability to occur a false positive is, we usually call this as the significance level of the test. So when we say, oh, we did a test with 95% significance, this, sorry, a, a test with 95% significance, this means that this test has a 5% chance of having a type one error, a false positive. Usually we call the false positive rate alpha. So alpha is the probability of a type one error, a probability of a false positive, which is the probability of rejecting the new hypothesis when the new hypothesis is true. Another term is also called the confidence level of the test. So the confidence level of the test is 100, one minus alpha percent. So 95% confidence means uh, that the test has a 0.05% alpha. Now, just like in the confidence interval, oh sorry, for example, uh, for a certain sample, uh, the value selected for alpha defines the threshold. So we can select alpha. If we select alpha, it defines the threshold of H0. So for if H0 is true, we can expect that the distribution of mean estimates is approximately normal with average 300 and standard error sigma divided by square root of n. So if we define a 0.05 to the alpha, the idea is that this is, this curve here is the distribution of sample means when the new hypothesis is true. So if the new hypothesis is true, our mean is 300 and there is a, there is a, <clears throat> there is a sigma. So we want, uh, if we say that, okay, we accept a 0 0.05 chance of um, type one error, this means that the rejection region should be the region that covers only 5% of this normal curve. So we can calculate this by using the, uh, qu the, quanta the percentile. So let's say that this is the 5% percentile of our normal curve for the new hypothesis. So our rejection region is anywhere 
from this 5% percentile below. This is our rejection region. If our estimated mean happens here, we reject the new hypothesis. Okay. Notice that maybe, even if the new hypothesis is true, the mean could happen here, and that would be a, a bad result. That would be a type 1 error. But we decided that we accept this probability of error. Now, to control the probability of type 1 error, this means that we can control the probability of type 1 error. We can select this region. For instance, we could select the region here, and we could have almost 0% of probability of type 1 error. The problem is that if the rejection region is too small, we can have type 2 errors that we're going to talk about in a second. Okay? So when we select the, the alpha, we can select the, uh, the, size, uh, the size of the rejection region. Now, the type 2 error is the false negative. The idea of the type 2 error is that we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So the probability of occurrence of a false negative in any hypothesis test is generally represented by the letter beta. So when we say the beta of a test, we're saying the probability of a false negative, which is to not probability of not rejecting the uh, null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. This quantity, 1 minus beta, is also known as power. So when I say this test is very powerful or this test is not very powerful, what I mean is that this test has, if it's very powerful, it has a low probability of a false negative. It has, if it has low power, it has a high probability of a false negative. Now, the type 1 error is very easy to control by controlling the size of the sampling distribution. We can control the size of the sampling distribution by controlling the alpha, that's the R critical region, and controlling the size of the sample. The bigger the sample, the narrower the sample distribution. However, the type 2 error is harder to control because the type 2 error has one information that we don't know. If, we, if, the, type, if the new hypothesis is false, which hypothesis is true? We don't know. We just know that the new hypothesis is false. So the type 2 error depends on the real value of the mean that we don't know. Okay. So for the new hypothesis, we define which value we know. But for the alternate hypothesis, we don't know what is the true value. We just know that it's not a new hypothesis. So if the true hypothesis, if the true value is close to the new hypothesis, the probability of a type 2 error is very large. But if the true value is far from the new hypothesis, the probability of a type 2 error is very low. Okay? Uh, so the power of a test is, has several factors. Of course, just like alpha, beta is also, also changes depending on the sample size and the significance level. But unlike alpha, beta is also depends on the real value of the parameter and the variance of the sampling distribution of the, popula of the, of the population parameter. So if the new hypothesis is false, a smaller magnitude of the difference will lead to a great probability of type 2 error. On the other hand, if the new hypothesis is false, if you have a type 2 error with a true value that is very close to the true hypothesis, then, well, this error is not so big, is it? I mean, if we have a type 2 error because the mean of our factory is really 299 grams and not 300, who cares, right? We are interested in big errors. We are interested in detecting a difference of 10 grams or 15 grams or 20 grams. We don't care about a difference of one gram. So to a certain level, type two errors are not so important as type one errors, okay? And because of this, because we can say, oh, we don't care about a difference of one gram, but we care about a difference of 10 grams, then we can determine the power of a test by saying, what is this desired difference? We're going to talk about this in a future course, but what we, can, what we want to say right now it's is that it's important to think about what is the desired difference? What is the difference in the hypothesis that we actually care about? Okay, so let's summarize type one error and type two error. Type one error, alpha, 
depends on the distribution of the new hypothesis. So it's easier to control. The type two error beta depends on the real value of the parameter. It's more difficult to specify and control. Because of these characteristics, we can say that to reject the new hypothesis is a strong conclusion. On the other hand, to fail to reject the new hypothesis is a weak conclusion, but we can strengthen it. So it's important to remember that failing to reject the new hypothesis does not mean that the new hypothesis is true. It only suggests that the new hypothesis is better than any other alternative model that we know so far. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna break here the video. And this is the general concepts be behind the hypothesis testing. In the next video, we're gonna talk about how to actually perform the test on data. See you there.